a sermon for the first Sunday after Trinity. Two stories that illuminate the background to our Gospel reading this morning. First, a carpenter shop in Nazareth. Tobias set out on a journey to Nazareth with his donkey in order to purchase a new banqueting table for his master. The road to Nazareth was long and little more than a goat track that wound its way eastwards into the Galilean pastures from the low-lying coastal plains of the west. After a three-mile walk he arrived in the town and promptly went into the carpenter shop, one he'd been told about and there met a man called James. They exchanged greetings and after finding a suitable table that would satisfy his master's needs Haggling over the price until an agreement was reached, they loaded the table onto the donkey ready for its journey back. So uh, this is Nazareth, said Tobias, the town where Jesus is from. From which Jesus are you talking about? asked James. Oh, you know, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, said Tobias. Everybody's talking about him. What do people say about this Jesus? asked James. Say he's some uh, miracle worker or a prophet, like John the Baptist. Some even say he is the Messiah, the chosen one of God. James looked down trying to contain his nervousness. And exactly where is this Jesus the prophet? said James. Oh, a uh, merchant told me he was in a town in Capernaum, of course. Uh, he moves around a lot. It, it's hard to say where he is. The men said their farewells and James marched hurriedly back into the shop to the back room. Mother, I know where he is. Mary looked up with her face tired and worn but said nothing. He has to be stopped, Mother, said James. He's destroying our family name. If he is not careful, he'll get himself killed with all the things he's doing and saying. But Mary remained still and contained, continued her mending. James rubbed his face with his hands and knelt down in front of her. Mother, you know what we have to do. It's for his own good. Mary looked up, her eyes moist with tears. She nodded her agreement and looked down again at the garment she was mending. It's decided then, said James. We go to him. We bring him back. A banqueting room in Jerusalem. Caiaphas sat at the table with his guests. There were two priests, a merchant from Gaul and three leaders from Galilee. The food was brought out regularly and they discussed many things, everything from Roman power to Jewish scruples. Then a messenger came in whispered something in Caiaphas's ear, to which his face turned red with anger. He rose from the table, went hurriedly to a side room, gestured the two priests to follow. Once in the room, he slammed his fists onto the wall, turned round to the priests. It's worse than we first thought. The Galilean, the one called Jesus, his popularity with the crowds grows every day. His fame and honour increases Ours decreases. We know where this is going. He must be stopped now. Shall we kill him? said one of the priests. No, said Caiaphas. That will only make him a martyr. We don't need to destroy him, only humiliate him in public. Disgrace him thoroughly, said Caiaphas. Then he won't be worth following. You know what to do. Make it so. Our Gospel reading about Jesus being mad or at least with the devil and about his confrontation with the experts from Jerusalem and his family is certainly not one that would have been made up by his followers. The priests and scribes didn't like what Jesus was doing because he didn't fit into their categories. Jesus wasn't accredited by them, so he had to be stopped. He had to be sidelined. 
If he was possessed by the devil, that would explain it and it would justify them doing what they wanted to contain and control him. But Jesus doesn't respond in kind. He doesn't lash back with an instant label for the scribes. He merely points out the flaw in their thinking. How can Satan cast out Satan, said Jesus? He would be fighting against himself. If a civil war was to break out in a kingdom, it would be the end of the kingdom. If members of a household fight amongst themselves, it's the end of a household. So if the devil is fighting the devil, the devil's kingdom must be coming to an end. So what Jesus is doing cannot be against God's will. And therefore, he must be doing the work of God's kingdom. But of course, their labelling was wrong and made up. Jesus gave them a true account of what he was going on. Someone stronger than the strong man who finds his house being burgled has now arrived, says Jesus. The strong man has been constrained and the kingdom in which people have been held captive by him have been set free. Jesus also reminds them that once they label the work of the Holy Spirit as the work of the devil, there's no way back because they have become blind to the truth. If you decide that the doctor who is giving you a life-saving op operation is there to kill you, there's no way you will give your consent for the operation to go ahead. When the crowd tells Jesus that his family is here, his words would have been scandalous to their ears. The family bond was tight, long lasting, part of the God given fabric of Jewish thinking and living. By breaking the link to family, Jesus was undermining a major pillar in the way first century Jews feel and think about the world and themselves. By speaking as he did, Jesus was challenging one of the symbols that lay at the heart of the Jewish sense of identity. God is doing the unthinkable. He's starting a new family, a new holy people, and he is doing it without regard for ordinary family bonds. There will be those inside and those outside. Allegiance to Jesus produces a division, often unexpected, sometimes unwelcome. But the call for Christians is to stick with Jesus, whatever the cost. Our journey of faith can be long and sometimes narrow. We face opposition from all quarters, but our readings tell us that we must persevere, not hide from God's call. In Genesis, we are minded, reminded that making excuses for our behaviour before God doesn't help or let us off the hook. We are answerable to him for our actions, for our choices that we make. Jesus chose a path that the religious authorities and his family didn't want him to take. We too will be asked to follow a different path to what the world expects. Paul too in his letter to the Corinthians tells us that although following Jesus will bring its trials and difficulties, knowing that Jesus never gave up and that God is there to renew and refresh and to illuminate the way ahead ensures that we can maintain a joyful and eternal perspective. We are to focus on Jesus who has been sent to restore God's damaged creation who God has raised from the dead and who will raise us up also. Through faith in Jesus, we are adopted into God's new family. We have a new story to tell with a new beginning, a new ending and a promise of a bright future and a home that is eternal in heaven.